So welcome everyone. My name is Dennis de la Corte and I will present to you today um, our work together with the Allotrope Foundation over the last couple of years and especially one recent proof of concept which we coined um, delivering digital transformation with self-reporting data assets which was done together with um, the Zonto company. Just for a full disclosure, um, I'm an assistant professor in physics and astronomy at Brigham Young University but I also hold the role as a chief science officer within Zonto. Um, Vinnie threatened you with some technical presentations. I'm not sure I'll fully deliver up to his expectations. Um, some of my slides will be more uh, process related, uh, business workflow related, but I hope at the end um, to deliver some value to you through um, the prepared slides. So let's jump on right in. Um, here's a short overview what we're doing at Brigham Young University. So our overarching goal is to build a leading center of molecular design, which means to us that we try to incorporate the best from all types of um, natural sciences um, that overlap together at what I consider the most interesting part of biophysical um, exploration right now. So um, you see a picture here with the recent members of my lab, um, which represent the different domains like physics, chemistry, computer science, biology, some chemical and mechanical engineering students are here. And what we are trying to do is to really solve some of the fundamental um, challenges around protein engineering and drug discovery. But we also do have um, some work related to laboratory informatics, where I think our work with the Allotrope Foundation fits in very neatly. So um, just to motivate this talk today and also give you a bit of insight of what we're doing, I <clears throat> brought one example of our work with me, um, which is a software package which we call PROSPER or Protein Structure Prediction that we have released about two years ago. And that was our attempt to reproduce a very game-changing technology developed by Google's DeepMind team called AlphaFold. So when that first software package was announced, um, AlphaFold and it showed that it was really good at folding protein structures and it wasn't quite clear if that technology would ever become publicly available and so we decided to reproduce it and we were rather successful at it, at least successful enough um, that we got mentioned by the DeepMind blog at one point and uh, our paper got cited quite a bit. So um, that was some work we did and during that process we learned a lot about deep learning, machine learning and how to push the frontiers of science and how we can go about answering some important and pressing questions. And what I think we learned here summarized on one slide is that in order to solve a very important scientific problem, it typically takes knowledge from different domains that are oftentimes integrated, but we now coin the data scientist. And the data scientist is typically someone that's heavily reliant on well curated and openly accessible data sets that are rapidly accessible for reuse. And so with protein folding, um, the database that was used is called the Protein Data Bank, where decades worth of experimental data from a variety of laboratories had been stored um, that run different experiments like X-ray crystallography, cryo-EM, NMR, some other modeling techniques to solve protein structures. And once those protein structures were solved, they were put into a standardized format, a protein data bank format, and were uploaded to the database. And that they were accessible for everyone. Now, not everyone could do the same things that DeepMind was able to do um, to actually use machine learning properly to derive data from it, but without the data set, even DeepMind wouldn't have been able to go and tackle this problem successfully. And um, just to give you a short flavor of how good these tools are, um, I have here two examples of structures that were solved with NMR. And when you look at the corresponding amino acid sequence that's posted below, you can see that these two strings here have only three letters that are different, which means those are proteins that have only three amino acids that have been changed and substituted. However, the result in different, um, these three changes result in a very different tertiary fold of the protein. And to be able to predict these slight variations in an input with fairly dramatic uh, dramatic results in the output, um, that is something that deep learning is able to do if it's being trained well. 
And so I think um, this is a nice proof of principle or proof of concept that once we have data for an important domain, well curated and stored so it's ready for reuse, then we can apply that and apply technologies from deep learning to really push the boundaries. And I think we can use these principles to also push drug discovery, clinical trial optimization, regulatory processes forward to truly deliver at one point personalized medicine rapidly and compliantly. And so that's sort of our motivation, what we're driving forward. And I think that the Allotrope Foundation is um, a great place to work together with to push this forward. Um, because there is a problem in the industry that is outlined here by Accenture. Um, in a recent report, they interviewed about 190 companies and they found that currently not everyone is ready to take this insight that data can be powerful into action um, because there are things missing. And what they identified were three major problems. First, that over 80% of the companies seem to lack an enterprise data strategy that really outlines the plan of how to use data for meaningful processes downstream. Then 84% of these companies, they lack a data platform that, would, could, that could help them and enable them to use data. And finally, maybe because of the demographic curve in the larger companies, um, only 20% of the employees seem to be able to fully understand and appreciate the value of data. And without this data literacy, as it's coined here, um, it's very hard to put the cultural change in place to make sure that data is curated and stored in the right perspective. And so in summary, we see that there's a lack in strategy, platforms and culture that is necessary to happen first in order to get data really in a shape where it can turn into an asset that powers useful applications. There are some consequences to this. Um, this is a prediction and report that shows where budgetary uh, money is going to go from the laboratories in the future. And as you can see, this um, exponential growth here um, keeps on continuing. And when you break down where the cost is associated with, you see that the prediction is that about 50% of cost is going down into services. And the reason for this is pretty simple. As some companies that are ready to use their data properly are applying machine learning and will put first drug products on the market and maybe even start to beat um, EROM's law and become um, actually again very profitable with drug discovery processes and uh, success rates, other companies will want to follow. And if it turns out that machine learning models are at the core of this progress and data, internal data is what can drive this, we will see huge efforts that will go down into data cleansing activities. So a lot of the data that is being produced today is not in the right shape to be reused in the future. But once these use cases start to become very clear and apparent, there will be a huge surge of data cleansing activities. And the costs and services that are associated with that, I think are fairly avoidable if a strategy is put into place now and a platform is being delivered that can drive a cultural change so that assets become readily available or digital transformation is successfully delivered. Now we have the slide that takes forever to load. It will come, I promise. Okay, there it is. Um, so the problem has been obviously addressed by multiple companies and has been well identified. Here's an example of um, Novartis, where their CEO stated that they really wanted to go about tackling this problem of unusable data and getting ready for machine learning. And the principles that were um, applied here in order to solve the problem, you probably all heard about, are the called so-called FAIR data principles. Where FAIR is an acronym that describes the shape of data as findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Now, the buzzword of FAIR has been going around the rooms for about five to six years, I think. And in that time, we have seen it in so many presentations, but how many truly delivered applications have we seen that have really fair data with real business benefits at the end? I think there's still an open question, an open problem. And so my presentation today about the self-reporting data assets tries to sharpen the fair data principles and tries to deliver a new approach to um, achieving the same goal, just not with this broad term of FAIR, but with this better described scope of SRDAs or self-reporting data assets. Um, the process at Novartis 
um, uncovered business issues that you probably have seen before as well, but let's go through the big problems that we have with data today. The first problem are data silos. So if you have a multinational company with laboratories in different locations that oftentimes have their different local IT solutions, it's very difficult for a data scientist in a centralized position to get access to all of the data. Just because there are some rules and regulations in place and connectivity issues, it's difficult to get that data. Um, let's assume the data scientist is able to connect to multiple data silos and incorporates the data out of it. What he then faces is oftentimes the problem of poorly managed data because the information that he gets will not be easy to interpret as he doesn't fully understand why the data set was created, which project does it belong to, which experiment is involved, who did this, why did they do it. Maybe he even gets the same data set three times and he doesn't know which one is the one he can believe. And so there are quite a few problems that come with these poorly managed data sets that require him to investigate and spend a lot of time calling people, investigating, interrogating, and trying to understand how to put the data into to the right context so he can use it for his machine learning. Then let's assume he did that and the data is now understood. What he oftentimes faces is the problem of interoperability. And you all know it, otherwise you wouldn't be in Yellowtrope Foundation. If I get data that is in a vendor lock because it belongs to company A, B, or C, it's very hard to align it and compare it to data that was maybe uh, produced with a competitor software solution or IT system. And so the predictions are that about 30 to 60% of the time of a data scientist is spent on solving this interoperability issue and making data from different sources well aligned so that they can do some translational sciences on it. Um, assuming that works as well, within Pharma we have the um, GXP sort dooming over us that also wants to make sure that whatever results we obtain from our data can be well justified. And assuming that we applied some black magic in order to pull the data from all types of places to Interpre inter interpret why it was created and what the context was and then somehow made it work to stitch it together. How are we going to justify the resulting machine learning models and the results that come from it to the authorities? So I think the compliance and data integrity issue will be a growing concern as we um, see more and more of this uh, work coming forth in the future. And I wouldn't be surprised if there will be more stringent regulations about AI as it's being used in the drug discovery process. So having problems is good because when you can describe them, it's typically easier to find a solution. So now we're really at the slide that takes forever to load because it's so important. Let's see. What you will see in a few seconds is a snapshot of the current Allotrope Foundation and its members and partner companies. And apparently I took a screenshot on a way to high resolution, so it takes a moment, but there we go. Um, so what you can see here is um, the number of companies and partners that are currently making up the Allotrope Foundation. And lots of you are in this call today, but I think it's worthwhile to point out that this is a very diverse group or diverse interests that came together to really solve some fundamental problems that everyone will benefit from. And so I think it's really fun to work with you together. So I'm pointing out that Brigham Young University is listed here. We have been a partner for about two and a half years now, and um, we have set out the goal to help the Allotrope Foundation to become uh, scientifically more visible, um, but also leverage the network and the connection that we have to truly understand what the problems in the companies are and to um, identify some solutions together with you. So um, one of the recent publications that we had, and I think I presented on this um, about six months ago in the spring conference, is a report on the history of the Allotrope um, Foundation and its main deliverables. This was published only in August this year in Duck Discovery Today, and it gives a nice overview of the different achievements and phases of the consortium. Um, one of the main deliverables, of course, is the Allotrope data format, um, which is able to solve quite a few of the problems that I have laid out before by integrating not only raw data but also descriptive information and um, audit trailing information to provide a full data lineage, uh, lineage as well as contextual information to put data into the right context. 
Um, and then, of course, the semantic technologies that we use that can leverage tabular or graph models, um, they're very powerful in representing ontological concepts that hopefully will, um, in the future, allow new semantic models um, to be trained that can really create connections between data sets that would otherwise be considered maybe disparate. So um, an overview of the different publications that we have put forth so far is given on this slide. Um, our first paper came out last year where we worked together with um, the Zontel uh, company and Brigham Young's um, library, which is one of the largest university libraries in the US. And we showed that the allotrope data format could be used very well to store and record some of the data and make it easily findable and accessible. Further, um, we have this report um, that was just shown on the previous slide about the, about the proceedings from the fall 2020 Allotrope Connect. So exactly a year ago, we decided together with the Allotrope Foundation to put a history paper together that can be well um, citable by others and that can also become an asset that we can openly share. And I acknowledge the support from the Allotrope Foundation in publishing it, especially in taking over the publication costs and drug discovery today, so that this is an article that is freely accessible and readable by anyone. So if you have colleagues or um, other interested parties that want to know more about the Allotrope Foundation and where it comes from, I really recommend that you share a link to this paper. They can directly download it, no cost associated, and can read up on what led to where we were last year and what the main deliverables, deliverables up to that point were. And I think it's still probably for the next year or so a good resource um, to use before we have to think about rewriting an update, maybe with the Allotrope simple model being delivered. Um, a follow-up to this paper was shown um, at a conference this year and it's been published with um, Springer Nature called um, the Data Centric Lab, a pharmaceutical perspective, where we sort of outline what the main bar barriers are that keep the lab from entering the digital age. And we identify allotrope amongst others um, as one of the key technologies that can really support the full digital transformation. So I think that's an interesting report that just shows strategically what allotrope can do. And um, I can recommend that as well. What's um, really interesting though, is uh, also the topic of today, the self-reporting data assets. Um, earlier this year in July, um, the article was accepted and pushed online by Drug Discovery Today that introduces the self-reporting data assets and how they're represented, but it doesn't, um, it is not fully, it's published, so it's, it's accepted, but it will be published soon. So you can go online and read the read it in its current form, um, but I'll, I'll send out a link or something for the Allotrope website as soon as this is finalized. Um, here we did work together with quite a few of the partner members uh, of the, of the mem of Allotrope member companies in order to identify what use cases are important um, to, be, to be solved by something we termed the self-reporting data assets. And then we worked also together with some of the partner companies like Agilent um, to write together the final article. I'm going to give you a short overview of that in the next couple of slides. And then finally, today's presentation on delivering digital transformation with SRDAs um, that has been submitted to a different conference that happens next month. Um, so it's an accepted paper that will also be published with Springer Nature soon. Um, however, I'm going to give you some sneak peeks into what's coming there already today. So um, if you're wondering what self-reporting data assets are, I think a little metaphor helps. So imagine that uh, you go out and you find an old stone. And there's some really interesting engravings on that stone and you want to understand what's up with it. And so you start fiddling around with it. And as you do this, all of a sudden that happens. So instead of having just a dumb stone in front of you, all of a sudden this hologram pops up and asks you, what do you want? And now you're able, instead of looking at the stone and trying to figure out where it comes from and what might it be, um, to interrogate and ask directly questions like, hey, who created you? What type of information do you contain? Why was that written out? Do you relate somehow to other things that I've read before? What is the context you come from? And so you can get direct interaction Q&A with this data asset. And so that enables you to fully understand and appreciate the message it tries to convey. And um, you can then put it into whatever you wanna do with it um, in terms of downstream uh, usage. And so I think when we call uh, data assets, so just 
a file that you have on your computer really a self-reporting data asset it means you must be able to send it over to a colleague and he must be able to open it to read it to understand it and to fully comprehend why this is here and how we can reuse it without having to call you or someone else if that is achieved then you have a self-reporting data asset in order to break down the requirements on these SRDAs further um, on this slide i have uh, put together the um, different use cases that we identified. And I really appreciate the interviews that we had with uh, people from Merck, BMS, and um, Novartis and other companies that have been partially mentioned in the paper, sometimes not. Um, so if you didn't get full credit there uh, because of some, for some reason, your company wasn't supportive of it, I want to uh, express my appreciation here again for the time you spent with us working on this. So we have been able to identify these use cases and then and did some um, re requirement engineering on them, extracted requirements. And then the logical question was, if we understand what makes an SRDA, we have to ask ourselves which data format is best suited at representing these SRDAs. And we then made a comparison between data formats and languages. Um, and we concluded that the allotrope data format is most suitable of representing these SRDAs. Now that brings us to the question, if I know how to represent an SRDA in the allotrope data format, how can I deliver this to um, end users? And so when we think back about the Accenture slide, we said that we need a strategy, a platform, and a cultural change. Now, if the strategy is to convert all data sets into allotrope, which I think is a reasonable strategy, then you have to think about which platform can deliver it. And so in this most recent work on delivering digital transformation with SRDAs, we teamed up with Zontl because they have a platform in place that can potentially do this. And just um, in case you have missed the presentations by Wolfgang and others last week, um, here's another short architectural overview of what the Zontl platform looks like. Um, it's this green box here that is able to ingest diverse data sets, which means data that comes from a variety of different um, data providers. It has uh, different file formats. It has different um, logical structures with it. But all this data comes and goes through an ingest pipeline in which it's being harmonized. And the harmonization and standardization step is really converting it into an allotrope file, aligning the metadata that you have with the allotrope data models, making sure that the raw data that comes is, com is reasonably converted into the um, HDF5 library so that you can, uh, in the data cubes, so that you can reuse it in the future. And once the summonization is done, the data can be long-term preserved by Zontl and then can also be exposed to downstream processing uh, for data-driven decisions. And here again, the API support that data is being shared in the allotrope data format or whatever data format um, is needed down there. Conversions to others are also possible. Um, to give you a feeling of how this harmonization works, um, here's a um, here's an example workflow shown that does the metadata mapping for Maslink system, where Zontl deploys a file watcher. Um, this file watcher um, is used in a bioanalysis workflow. It watches the folder structure as soon as the new data asset is produced here. It extracts automatically from the folder structure and some um, text files here, header text file, information about the specific experiment that was run, but then also higher order metadata about the project that was run, which instrument ran it, and then what type of analysis was done here. And all of this information is being mapped together into a metadata catalog and then accessible for search within Zontl so that you can now find that specific experiment, maybe on some experiment specific key terms, or you can do some overarching searches on projects where you find all types of experiments that were done for this, uh, for this research question you had. And so that type of mapping is done in the harmonization step and ensures that the data files that came in are now well represented so that they can be easily found and then they can easily be shared. And because we have this interoperability through the data for the allotrope data format, then we can rapidly build visualizations on top of it. And this is really what I consider delivering digital transformation. That is not only making sure that the platform puts the data into the right shape, but then it exposes it so a data scientist can rapidly develop um, visualization tools. And so, for example, uh, what we have shown is that we can build mass spectrometry data viewers on top of the data that was harmonized. 
um, that prints out uh, chromatograms that are interactive. Um, it also allows you to trigger and to um, view spectra that are belonging to the chromatograph data points, and it gets you really the chance to query data without the need of any expert tools directly in the Zontal Space system. Or you can um, build an HPLC data viewer where you can overlay potentially chromatograms from different vendors, which is a really great application, or you can do something similar for cell culture data. Now, the details uh, on this are, like I pitched before, are being presented um, in this um, upcoming conference um, and in this uh, new paper that will come out soon. Um, but I think this is a nice proof of principle that shows at least on one slide what it means to deliver digital transformation with SRDAs. It means to have a platform in place that converts data into this open format, allotrope, and then uses this to bring business value to people in terms of um, translational sciences and comparisons that were previously not possible. So this sort of concludes our current work that we have done, um, but I want to end with a pitch or rather invitation to think about what's next and what we can do maybe together even with Brigham Young University and some of you guys. And so what I think would be really wonderful is if as the next application we show that machine learning on allotrope data files has great benefits compared to what is currently being done. And so um, in-house, we have been doing things on molecular docking studies. We will do some image classifications. We do some things called free energy calculations. So those are things we're doing currently. However, we can see other um, use cases also on the horizon and would be very interested to explore those with you. And so what I can um, tell you, what we can offer is we have this team of well-trained academic data scientists. We have pretty high-end supercomputing capabilities in-house. We have access to affiliate laboratories where necessary. And I guess we have demonstrated our ability to plan, execute, and publish. So if you work together with us, we can um, definitely help you to come up with a cool storyline that can be published afterwards, that can really help the Allotrope Foundation gain its visibility and hopefully even deliver a technology that gets us new insights that are previously not accessible. And so what we really need to do this, however, is um, some relevant business cases. So we have some NMR data models, we have some um, mass spec data models, HPSC is there. So I think there are some things around that Allotrope can already um, clearly map to Allotrope data models, um, but we don't really have huge data sets yet available. So if you have an idea of how we could use some of those um, data formats and the data they contain in order to explore some type of machine learning application with it, I'd be really interested to discuss this with you and invite you to reach out to me um, at any point. So um, with this, I'm at the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.